right, hello again and welcome back to another Lunch and Learn session sponsored by A.T. Still University's Information Technology Services Group and Human Resources Group. So I'm Brian Kruzniak, I'm one of the co-hosts and our other co-host Joe Vincent is busily working in Arizona today so he can't be with us but hopefully we'll have him back uh, before long. During our session today, we've got some good stuff. We'll be joined with, by uh, Beth Thompson, uh, who will help us out in the Break to Educate section, giving us some hints on Excel. We'll find out who the next winner is for April of the lynda.com mug. And then our main uh, feature today will be with the Learning Resources Group, so we'll talk to them a little bit. But before I introduce our guests, I want to again invite everyone to make sure they participate between bites of their sandwich or between phone calls. Um, by putting information into the chat. So if you have questions, if you have thoughts on anything uh, any of us say, please just enter a little bit into the chat um, and kind of make this more of a two-way communication. So that would be great. Um, as you can see, our set is a little bit different today. We're getting ready to wrap up the end of this season and starting to think about next season. So we're going to experiment a little bit more with some of the set pieces and uh, hopefully when we get back next, uh, next fall, then you'll see a little bit more changes. And, and again, what we're trying to do with these is not only provide good information to you, but also to experiment a little bit with the technology. So we're really trying to find that right balance of in-person communication with remote communication um, and technology recording and, and whatnot. So again, if you have any thoughts, uh, please pop those in the chat and get us some feedback that way as well. So let's get started today. We've got with us uh, the group from Learning Resources. Uh, that group is headed up by Tim Tucker. And then also with us, we have on the Missouri campus, Tom Van Vleck. And then coming to us remote, uh, we have Art Matthews. So hey, Art. So let, let's get started with Tim, since this is kind of the group that you head up. Tim, maybe you can give us a little overview of what Learning Resource is all about, what type of staff you have, and uh, what, what your coverage area is. Learning Resources is comprised of um, seven people. Uh, there are two learning enrichment advisors on each campus for a total of four, and there is a counselor on each campus for a total of two, uh, and then administrative support located on the Missouri campus. So there are seven of us. Um, uh, we provide, the, I think the most important work we do is the, is the counseling, uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I know that lives have been saved as a result of that. Uh, the learning enrichment is important in terms of managing the everyday uh, academic support. People can come in and get uh, strategies for review, uh, for test taking, that sort of thing. I really like the way you kind of broke it uh, down when we were talking before. The learning resources group kind of keeps kids in school and doing well, and the counseling group actually saves lives. Yeah. So it's a pretty good breakdown. <laughs> Um, let, let, let's start out, if, you, if we can, with the learning resources area and, and talk a little bit about that. What kind of um, remediation do you guys do? What types of services do you provide? Who is the typical student who comes to you looking for service? We're advocates. Uh, so we'll, 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 we'll be go-betweens between uh, the student and the faculty members. Uh, so in terms of remediation, well, we do work with the Student Progress Committee on the Arizona campus and the, and the uh, Promotion Board on the Missouri campus. Day-to-day uh, -day stuff, who do we see, who walks in? Um, uh, students, students, we're working with high pair students, you name the program. Physical therapy, athletic training, physician's assistant, the dental students, the DO students, um, hard, hard charging, um, good students. Type uh, A type personalities. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's fair. Uh, we've got some type Bs in there too. <laughs> uh, it takes all kinds. Uh, so, uh, so uh, they do not want to face up to areas where they may be weak, they're not used to weaknesses, they're used to success, they're used to A's and a few B's here and there. It's hard to get into these programs, so we're, we're, getting, we're getting good applicants. Uh, this is a great place for being average <laughs> as soon as you walk in the door. And so a lot of times it's just a matter of, of, of you know, where is your, where is your place 
in, in the curriculum and, and what do you do to, to, to keep it even? And if you want to take it up, how do we do that? Uh, so we respond to the folks with 90% and above as well as we do uh, 70 and above or below. So it's really anyone who's in need of some kind of study help or, or just help with classes. Is there also a group that has maybe specific learning disabilities that you kind of focus in on or maybe have more of an expertise in helping that group? Students with learning disabilities account for about 2% of the campus. That number is rising and the complexity of the disabilities is increasing. Uh, the accommodations that we make are um, more sophisticated than they once were. Uh, we've, we've gone from providing extended time or a separate environment or both. That was pretty much no matter what your disorder was, that's what we were going to do, to things like uh, we provided Kurzweil to a, a dental student here recently. So Con what, is, what is that, a Kurzweil? It's a software that converts text to sound. So okay. It'll read a, a PDF or a PowerPoint uh, uh, and convert that to sound, so, and you can choose your voice and that sort of thing. Uh, so, 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 surprisingly, some students don't read well, um, hardly at all. The comprehension might not be there, even though they can see and pronounce the words. It's not like dyslexia. Uh, so, so those sorts of things have, have begun to increase, and, and we've responded to that. But meat and potatoes is, is, is the student who's sitting there at, you know, just skimming above 70% and wanting to improve. Okay. Uh, maybe bit by bit. Usually what they've done is come in with the same technique that, that they used since they were a freshman in college. You know, and, and suddenly they're challenged with more content and more complexity than they've ever seen. So I'm guessing, I mean, most students to even get to this point have probably learned to, to cope or developed certain study habits that worked for them fairly well in the past. And it might be more of an adjustment if they're in the, those same skills that they've used in the past aren't working to, you know, kind of cope with that change and develop some new strategies. Yeah, adjustments of a, a big focus, big, a, lot of, a lot of what we do. I mean, sometimes just moving. Uh, leaving a family, uh, or maybe leaving a, a, a spouse or, and a family behind. You know, it's uh, more than even just the growth and development that goes uh, with with those earlier years. Yeah. W what would be the process that a student would go through? Because I think many of us, I, I, I wouldn't know, um, a student goes through to get accommodations. Is, is there a formal process that they have to go through? We can help even you, Brian. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> I need a lot of help. Uh, it's a request, uh, email, phone call. Uh, several of us are identified for uh, referring, recommending the student. Uh, there's a committee on each campus that reviews the request. Fair amount of paperwork. Uh, the, the, the main issue for us is, is what do your boards require? Uh, what the, the standards that the school might want met to provide accommodations will be very different from what the boards will want met. Um, the, the, boards, the boards are going to respond to future patients and the school is going to respond to here and now, the student. Uh, and so we, we share the same goal that we want the best clinician we can get out there, uh, different responsibilities. So we, we, we set up the documentation requir requirements that we think that the boards are going to need, and then we, we have them jump through all those hoops. A lot of evaluations and assessments, a lot of expert okay. um, um, assessment. And, and you're speaking about clinicians and creating the best clinicians, but w what about those students who aren't necessarily in the clinical programs or even the online programs? Uh, do, do you help them as well? Yes. Um, good point. Uh, it is easy to, to look toward the clinicians first. Uh, I, we're working with online students. We, um, there's a, we work with deaf students. We, we work with uh, the hearing impaired. We work with uh, students who have um, um, PTSD. Uh, so, some students have some learning disorders and we needed to stretch out the, uh, we needed an alternative schedule. There used to be a requirement uh, on, for online programs that, that you take two courses at once. Uh, that, that is now optional and that was, that's essentially universal design. That permits a student with those disorders to um, uh, choose their own schedule and that's good for everybody. 
Hey, what, what about technology? I mean, me as a technology person, I see all of these tools that are available to learn things in different ways or present material in different ways, whether it's the Kurzweil where it's reading to you or combining video with text or transcripts. Uh, what, what are you seeing in terms of technology? Is it helping? Is it hurting? Technology has helped a lot. Uh, and. I I have trouble responding your, to your question because there's so much I don't know about it, and it's and it's expanding daily. Uh, I just saw a demonstration last week uh, with accessible technology, and, and um, on on his cell phone, uh, an academic advisor pulled up uh, a half a dozen ways to uh, either convert text to sound or sound to text. Some some people. <laughs> can't understand what they've heard, but they can understand what they read. Sure. Uh, and, and so it does that as well. Um, uh, can, can change the font. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much on the low end of this side. We're, we're not working with, I haven't been challenged with, with students to require that level of support, but I, I will be. Now that that support is there, more students will qualify, and we will admit them, and they will succeed. Sure. Sure. Uh, so it's going to be up to us to figure that out. Tim, how, how, how do you work with faculty? So if a faculty person sees that a student might be struggling, um, you know, how does the faculty person interact with you? How do you interact with the faculty to let them know what the services are that are available? I, uh, I've never been more impressed with colleagues than I have been with our faculty on both campuses. They're, they, they are 100% committed to the student. Uh, they also have the responsibility of upholding the standards of the university, and they're excellent at, at finding that balance. They're the first to refer students. And, and uh, how, how does a faculty person go about referring a student? In particular, the, the question coming from online about how do you refer an online student? Uh, it works the same way. Uh, an email, a phone call, uh, or the professor says to the student, I, I, I want you to go talk to learning resources. Usually that's what the professor does. They leave it up to the student to, to follow through on it. Uh, and, and that usually works just fine. Uh, often, if, if the professor recognizes that there could be some help, uh, the student is more likely to respond to that than probably any other source. Okay. And is there a minimum criteria that students must meet? Do they have to be doing very poorly in order to be able to take advantage of services? Or can they any, any student go about getting service? Any student. Any student. The ones that are going to be referred by faculty are probably the ones that are going to be struggling in the course. And typically the student is struggling before they realize it, often believing that, well, I'll get, I'll succeed on the next one. And not. Yeah. Uh, uh, so faculty will be the first to kind of track the points and notice and suggest. There's right. another and approach. I'm assuming it's the same for all programs? Uh, it, it has been for us, yes. Uh, okay, we get right. referrals from all, all programs. Okay. All right. Well, I think um, that kind of gives us a good overview of the department as a whole and the learning resources component. Let's take a quick break, and then we'll come back, and hopefully we can get Art back online. And uh, if not, we'll go to Tom, and we'll start uh, focusing a little bit more on the life-saving part, the counseling side. So let's go to a break. Hopefully everyone was awake for our little uh, message there. And please do uh, sign yourself up for Twitter and the ITS alerts. It's a great way to get information. So before the break, we kind of hit with Tim and learning resources. Let's switch now. We've got Art Matthews back and Tom Van Vleck here in, uh, in the studio. Um, <laughs> And tell us a little bit, guys, about what you do in terms of counseling, and maybe, Tom, we can start with you. And if you have more of an area that you feel like you specialize in, um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, Art and I both are licensed in, in our states. Art is licensed in Arizona, me in Missouri, so we're, and, and we both have a lot of experience uh, before we came to ATSU as well. 
Uh, I've got about 25 years of counseling experience. Uh, and I've had a, a wide range of issues that I've dealt with over my career. I think uh, working in Kirksville, those who've been here know it's a, it's a small town and you, it's hard to specialize in any one specific area. And so uh, that's been good for me to come here because I had a wide range of experiences before I came here. Uh, but we uh, provide uh, general mental health. And, you know, uh, I, while I'm very flattered, Tim, uh, you know, makes a statement that he feels like that we've saved people, and, and hopefully we have in that process, uh, that we deal with a wide range of issues, and, and there's things that come up that are, are not life-threatening or changing in that way. So I hope people think that they can, they can come to see us for a wide range of issues. And, and uh, you know, and, and another a nice perk that we have at this school is, is that uh, we've been allowed to extend our services to the spouses of oh, the nice. students as well to see them individually and uh, I've yet to find another school that does that and I think that's a really important uh, point to make and uh, but I deal with a wide range of issues that come up and uh, you know and I think it's uh, uh, it's sometimes can be very challenging but I feel like that we've got art between art and I we're pretty experienced and uh, if I don't know an answer, he will, and we kind of we'll work back and forth sometimes on, on things. And Art, what about you in Arizona? Same kind of thing, more general types of issues, or do you focus in one area or another a little bit more? Well, we're different from medical professionals in that we don't really have specializations. There's no such thing as a technical specialization. The license itself uh, for us, licensed professional counselor, um, kind of puts us in that general category. There are licensed marriage and family therapists. There are licensed clinical social workers, and they all have different uh, trainings, but they're, we're doing similar work. Uh, and Tom and I are both the licensed professional counselor. Um, I'm sorry if I sound a little silly because I just got out of the dental chair. <laughs> <laughs> so half my face is, is not awake yet. Um, I've worked... Uh, I graduated in 99 from Southeast Missouri State and uh, a KCREP accredited program. Um, I have worked almost exclusively in higher education since then in academic advising and, and counseling programs and have worked from, you know, crisis intervention all the way to, uh, you know, the, the typical things that most of our students are dealing with grief, anxiety, stress, depression, sure. uh, relationship issues. So, I mean, th these are kind of touchy issues, I'm sure, that both of you guys are dealing with. H how do you handle confidentiality? I mean, Kirksville is kind of a small town. The Mesa campus is a very small, tight campus. I mean, just even logistically, how do you handle confidentiality issues? So maybe first time, and then we'll go to Art. Well, uh, Art and I both keep our records separate from the, from the university. So there's, uh, you know, I often tell students that nothing goes on your permanent record here. This is, we keep our own records of, of what we deal with. And I found, you know, I've been here working on a decade, and I found that the student is, or the, the school has been very respectful of that, that issue of confidentiality, allowing us to, to keep that separate because they realize it's important or else the students aren't going to want to come and talk to us. Sure. And then as far as uh, the, the confidentiality in a, in a physical sense, uh, I, I'm personally up on the third floor of the Gutenson building. And the, the reason for that is, is I'm on over with the, with the docs over there is to create some confidentiality for the students to come up and see me. That, you know, I'm not down in student affairs. Uh, sometimes I get a little hidden away, but so I like to plug that every once in a while. But I think it's been really nice for the students to have that ability to, to come up and, and they, they, people don't see them come in or out. A little around. bit further yeah. removed, yeah. And what, what about on the Arizona campus, Art? Um, you know, same thing with records. Uh, we, I do not have any of my records go into any university database or system. It's, it's my own records, um, except for situations where in each state we're required to uh, make sure that somebody is safe either they're uh, suicidal, homicidal, those kinds of things. Uh, the basic 
safety of the of the client or another person, though that's the only time in which we can break confidentiality. My particular office is located um, across the street from the the 5850 building, which is a lot of us call the main building, and uh, I'm located in the building where our online and red. Uh, residential admissions are so I'm I'm tucked away there's no need for any students to be in my particular area there's no need for any uh, most faculty there's just a few faculty from the uh, Cogs school that um, have some cubicle space around the corner from us so that that makes it pretty uh, pretty confidential and private what about from an online standpoint? I, I mean, I'm sure what you guys are, are maybe more traditionally used to is that person-to-person -person interaction with the students who are out on rotations or at the community health centers or our online students. Um, how do you provide services to that group? Well, that, that we becomes... particularly for our online students. Uh, we work with residential students and... Uh, Tom and I are both, because we're licensed by a state, we can only work with students who are physically located in those states. Um, when it comes to students on rotation, we can provide consultation if they're outside of Arizona or Missouri and help them locate services that are close to them. Uh, but just like the university doesn't provide health services for all of our students, we don't provide counseling services for all of our students. Can you guys be used as, you said, cons consults? Is that the same as uh, referencing or um, you know, referring giving a referral to a student? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I do um, a lot with the, you know, with, if there's an issue with a student who's out on rotations out of the state. And, and like Art said, I mean, sometimes there's legal ramifications for us doing that uh, in different states. So we have to be careful about that. But, you know, I'll speak with the student, find out what their issue is, and then find out where they're located and then find out about the, the services in, in their general location and get them the help they need. Right. And I think, you know, you mentioned the ability to use, uh, or to, for spouses to be able to use our services. Um, to me, that's probably a pretty big thing. I would think a lot of what you see maybe is additional stress on relationships um, that can affect their, their coursework. Right. I don't want to say Kirksville is a tough place for some people to, to, to live. <laughs> I personally really love it, but I think for a lot of the spouses, they come here and their, their student is so busy, you know, that they're, it's, it takes a lot of effort on their part and they're, they're kind of, you know, left alone. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, we like to do relationship building uh, things. And that's why I also try to mention that, you know, my services go beyond the uh, you know, you don't have to have a diagnosable disorder, mental health disorder, to come and see me. Uh, it can it can be you know self improvement or just uh, you know having a basic simple problem that we can talk about. And if a student wanted to make an appointment, how would they go about doing that? Let's go to Art. Uh, well, we have an online uh, scheduling system that we operate through a company called Appointments Plus. If students will send us, uh, most of the time students send us emails because phones aren't used as phones anymore. I, I know that's a shocker, <laughs> but <laughs> cell phones are just used for texting and people can't text me here at work. So uh, get an email and then I send an email back and I alert them to that online scheduling system. It's very convenient, students like it. They can schedule any time of the day or night. They can cancel, uh, reschedule. Um, and they're the ones that know their schedules the best. I'm usually pretty open. Great. Now, the, the one other thing that I w was going to ask you guys about is I, I know the university has kind of been looking at risk and emergency crisis type situations. I know that there's been a crisis team set up on both campuses. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and your role in it. Um, let's start, Tom, on the Missouri campus, and then any differences to Art and uh, Arizona. Well, and, and that grew out of a, a situation, you know, in Kirksville a few years ago, we had a tornado, and it, uh, it impacted some, some of our students. And, and uh, I found myself in a situation where I wanted to go out on site where the, some students had their, their apartments and living uh, quarters had been destroyed in the tornado. And, but I also, it was important for me to stay in my office because if someone was going to look for me, where are they going to look? They're going to come to my office. 
And so Ron Gaber, who was here then, thought we needed to, st to get a group together here on this campus. So it started here and we've tried to transfer it out to Arizona, but it's the uh, Student Crisis Response Team. And we tried to identify some people in, in different uh, areas of the university. You know, there's someone from the dental school here and, and several from KCOM and from the School of Health Management. And there are people who have a background either in, in uh, some type of counseling, counseling experiences, but we've also got them uh, training in mental health first aid. Okay. And then that's to assist if, if in those situations where there's just not enough of Art and I to go around, so right. to speak. Art, anything different in the Arizona campus? Well, you know, I, I, I just want to go back and, and say that, that that crisis team is really designed for those kinds of bigger things. Um, a, a tornado, a, a natural disaster, active shooter, we call it. You know, those kinds of things where uh, there's a lot of stuff going on and it may be difficult to reach either Tom or I. It's not an individual student crisis. Um, and you know, we, we have a much smaller group here just because uh, we have our, our students are spread out over a much greater area um, in Mesa or Scottsdale or Chandler or some even in Phoenix. So uh, it's it's harder to, to create a, a, a network that's going to cover all of that area. Sure. So we, we mainly focus just on the campus here. And uh, Tom and I both have, have set up uh, a manner in which an individual student in crisis can reach some sort of service when we're not in the in the office when when our offices are closed because we don't provide necessarily 24 hour a day seven days a week uh, service. Yeah, one of the things that came up was you know like uh, if you call a lot of uh, counseling resources in the community and and if you get their answering machine the first thing you're going to hear is is if this is an emergency, go to the ER, call 911. And so we wanted to create a layer between that, you know, for like an after hours emergent issue. Uh, because like, for example, here in Kirksville, the ER is literally across the street. And if they go there with an issue, there's going to be our students are going to be in the ER over there. Right. And, and, and confidentiality, it makes it difficult sometimes for them to take that step. And so we wanted to have that, that layer in between where they could, they could get some after hours help if they can't, couldn't reach me or Art after hours. And, uh, and, and so I think it's been very beneficial. That's great. I think it's a great service that you guys provide, both from the learning resources side and the counseling side, and uh, certainly the kind of overlap that probably happens on several uh, in between. So hopefully you guys can stick around for a little bit. We'll see if there are any other questions. So if there are questions, please pop them into the chat. We'll get back with Tim, Art, and Tom uh, and get to those questions. We're going to go to a quick break first, and then we'll come back and do our break to educate. Cute. So please add your Gmail signature. We're kind of growing at the rate where it's not like we know everybody anymore. So please uh, use that little tool so that we can learn who one another are. Um, next, we've got our Break to Educate, which is a little segment we do that uh, tends a little bit more toward technology and learning new features and functions and tools. And we have our resident expert from CGHS, Beth Thompson. She's going to go through some uh, Excel tips and techniques. So Beth. Absolutely. I'm hoping everybody can hear me just fine. Um, a few 
days ago I was contacted by Jean to, to do a little bit more on Excel. I guess a lot of people have been having questions on Excel. So I'm going to pull up a couple of common um, tricks and tips that may help you when you're, when you're creating a spreadsheet or when you're trying to work with data. So um, if we could bring that up, there we go. Um, when you're working in Excel, obviously you have the, the, the cells. And if you notice, my cursor right now is white. That means I can select things. What most people don't know is if you bring your cursor to the bottom right corner, there's a little black box in the cell and your mouse actually turns black. When that happens, it now becomes what's called a fill handle. It basically is a kind of shortcut to do copying. But Excel thinks it's smart, so it actually doesn't just do regular copying. If you have a number just like one, if you were to click and drag this down, notice it copies one all the way down. But if you were to, to copy one and two together, it thinks, well, obviously you want to do a series. So it, when you copy it down, it actually adds one to each number. Same thing with the one and three. It assumes, well, you went from one to three, so I'm thinking you probably want to go five, seven, nine, et cetera. So it kind of does a little bit of the thinking for you. It does the series for you. Now, it's smart, but it's not quite that smart. So if you want to do things that are multiplication or exponents, you cannot do that with the fill handle. It just sticks to basic adding by ones or twos or threes. Another quick aside tip that some of you know about, some of you don't, there's an auto sum button. So if I want to add across, I can just hit that button, it'll automatically add it. But the new version also has an auto average, an auto count, an auto max, an auto min, that when you select them, it automatically says, oh, whatever function, it must want to do it to those numbers. The reason I showed you this is the same copy procedure can be used with functions and formulas. So I can use this little box in the corner, copy down, and it has copied my function or formula all the way down. So it, it has kind of a dual purpose of filling in numbers, filling in dates, but also copying anything. Excel assumes also that when you have the word Monday, you really don't want to copy Monday. It assumes that you want to copy through all the days of the week. So when you use that little fill handle, it does Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday for the months of the year, January, February, etc. If you have the month and the year, it will automatically do the months, but continue on till the next year, the next year, and so on. If you have a specific day, like January 1st, it will then do January 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, etc. So this little fill handle is a really good way of copying to fill in data without having to type it in. If you want more advanced features than just these, there is a fill button up here where you can actually fill different series. You can do linear, adding one, growth, which is multiplication, and however you want to, to step that. So the fill will give you more options. Another question I had was on how to freeze. Um, a lot of people don't know that you can freeze your screen to see certain parts. If you go to view, freeze panes, and pick the top option, it's just going to randomly freeze in the middle of your screen. It's going to freeze some of the top there, some of the side there. Not exactly what is useful. However, you can do freeze 
freeze top row. And what that will do is keep the top row visible no matter how long you, you scroll. Same concept if you do freeze first column, it will freeze the first column as you scroll across that will stay with you. But you may want to freeze more than that. Say I want to freeze the first two columns. If you want to freeze more than one column or more than one row, you click to the right of where you want to freeze or below where you want to freeze. So if I wanted to freeze A and B, I'd click on C to the right and hit freeze. That will then freeze A and B only. Same thing if I wanted to freeze rows one through four, I would click on five and freeze panes. And that would freeze one through four. A quick warning, uh, when it says freeze top row, it really means the top row that's visible. So if I was down here in the middle of my screen and I froze the top row, it would freeze row 31. So the freezing is what is visible, not necessarily the literal top row. So I had a question come in from someone, how do you undo something? Uh, there are a few ways to undo. Uh, if you're a keyboard shortcut junkie, control Z works. Um, up on the toolbar, there's actually, um, we can't see it on here, but there is an undo button. However, there are certain things that cannot be undone. Um, freeze panes cannot be undone. Um, if you freeze something and want to not do it, you have to literally unfreeze. So there's not always a perfect way to undo everything. But Control Z is going to give you the most options. Uh, one last thing I was going to show people is, um, uh, it's a more of an advanced feature, but it's one that I use quite often when I'm working with people who are using a lot of data. If you notice, this spreadsheet here that I have has lots of data. It's actually all of the courses that we have. But I want to be able to see only the courses that I've done or only the courses from a certain term. There's a great feature if you select all of your data and use this format as table. Now, most people look at this and say, well, that's just to make it pretty. Actually, it's not. It, the format as table actually has a great deal of functionality. So I'm going to pick one here that has a fairly decent contrast, so I hope people can see it. You want to make sure that your table has headers. And yes, it makes it fairly pretty. But if you notice, I'm going to change the font here so it's a little bit more visible. If you notice when I made it format as table, it actually put these little drop down arrows everywhere. The drop down arrows allow you to filter and sort your data any way you want it. So for example, I want to know all of the stuff that I've done. I don't want to see everybody else. I just want me. There I am. Well, I want to know only the ones that are complete. So I don't want the no's, I just want the yeses. Now notice, now it's only the ones that I've done that are complete. Um, we can't really see it on this screen, unfortunately. Oh, there we can. If you notice on the left now, notice the rows go 1, 11, 12, 13, 21, 28, 29. All of the data is still there. It's just hiding. It, we're just filtering out what we want to see. If I want to undo that, I can just go back and say, well, OK, I want to see everybody again. And I want to see all of them, not just the complete ones. You can also sort them. You can sort custom sort. By doing this, you get a lot more options. 
It also gives you an option in the design view here. You can obviously change the colors. But you can add a total row at the bottom. And the total row will allow you to put you know, your calculations. You can have it do the darker first column, a darker last column. You can have it do really funky column colors. Or you can even take out the colors of your of your table. So again, this isn't just for pretty. It is a very functional tool. I had a question come in, if I want to switch C and D, how, how could I do that? If you see my mouse here, um, I, it turns to a kind of a plus with a couple arrows at the end. That is the moving cursor. White is select. Black is copy, black with the arrows is move. And I can actually just drag and drop. Oh, it's not going to let me. Because it's a table, I'm going to insert it and now do the drag and drop. It won't let me because of the table. So I can move. Move over here and move it over. If it was, oh, it's not going to let me because of the table. Hold on one second. Try it this way, see if it works. Come on, there it is. Little plus, drag and drop. You can also use, obviously, insert, um, cut, and copy also work to move columns around. Um, with the table, it, it has issues because it's now a fixed kind of a coded type database thing, so that's why it wouldn't work there. Um, so those are some of the questions that have come in while I've been working on here. So um, if you do have any specific things that you want me to present during these sessions, please shoot me an email. Um, or if you want more information on how to do very specific things, please contact me. Uh, my email is brthompson at atsu.edu. Um, I'm on this Kirksville campus, but I'm more than willing to help anybody on any campus. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Excellent. Thanks, Beth. And so that's both the advantage and the disadvantage of being live in studio rather than canned. We can actually take questions from the audience, but you don't always know exactly the questions, so you have to kind of hunt and peck a little bit. That was great. So thanks, Beth. I'm sure we can use uh, entire sessions for uh, tips and techniques. So that's great. Um, I think we're going to wrap up uh, kind of with the uh, winner of the lynda.com mug uh, for April. So um, as Beth was saying, you know, uh, email her if you have questions about Excel, but give a little plug to um, lynda.com since this is the uh, lunch and learn uh, show. We want you to learn, and there are tons of options, courses, segments that you can go through on just about anything uh, with lynda.com. So let's go to that clip quick and uh, we'll show you the winner for this month. Great. Congratulations, Carolyn, in the museum. I uh, hope you enjoy your mug and uh, hope it encourages other people to uh, take advantage of that tool, lynda.com. It's a great benefit uh, that the university provides for all of us. 
I um, want to thank everyone. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Tim, uh, Tom, Art, um, everyone for today's session. Uh, thank the crew behind the scenes. They've done a great job at developing the new set. Um, as I said, kind of watch for uh, next season, as we call it, when we come back in the fall. And uh, we'll really try and focus on finding that right balance between using technology and uh, in-person type skills. And so if, if you have anything as a faculty person or as a staff person that you think you might be able to teach or encourage someone else to learn using these tools, um, please get a hold of us. Um, either in academic technologies or the help desk. Um, that's really why we're doing these, or part of the reason we're doing these is to try and encourage people um, to use these tools. So it's great. Thanks again, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. That'll probably be our last session. We may have one or two more um, before we break for the summer. And uh, uh, great. Have a great week. Thanks.